Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Kerbal Space Program video in which we are going to be flying, in case you couldn't tell from either the title or what you're seeing on screen now, a space shuttle replica um, to low Kerbin orbit. And what makes this one pretty cool is the fact it can carry 36 tons, i.e. a fully laden orange tank uh, to an orbit of 100,000 meters above sea level, which is, I think is pretty difficult to do with space shuttles. Uh, not only do I consider space shuttles pretty difficult to make compared to most other things you can do in Kerbal Space Program, it's even harder, I think, to build ones that can carry, you know, significantly heavy payloads. My only other space shuttle, at least the only other space shuttle I've posted on YouTube before, the Brutus, which was in that, which um, carried the first segment of my popular building a space station video. That couldn't quite carry 36 tons, and I always kind of wanted to build a bigger version of the Brutus, and this is it, the Tatsu. So this is a... Well, there are two space shuttles, well there were two space shuttles I could say, I should say. Uh, there was the American one, which this is a replica of, and then there was the Russian one called the Buran. Uh, most people's first KSB space shuttles, I think, are closer to the Buran than they are to the American one. The Buran didn't have solid rocket boosters on the side for one thing, you know, the ones that we just dropped off, which we were using SRBs, just like the American one, although in Kerbal Space Program there aren't sufficiently big enough solid rocket boosters to really make accurate shuttle replicas, so I kind of strapped four together. Anyway, the Russian one used four um, liquid fuel boosters instead just because the Russians were more familiar with liquid fuel technology. Uh, and yeah, the main tank there, the one that the orbiter is attached to, that would have engines on as well. So I'd say most people's first KSP shuttles are probably designed like that just because it's a lot easier to design shuttles in that way. Um, but I kind of like the challenge of building one that's more similar to the American version. And we're actually following the same kind of flight path as well in that we're rolling over onto the space shuttle's back so the, tank, the external tank is on top of us, and then as soon as that tank depletes, uh, we're just keeping an eye on the fuel levels there at the bottom next to the Kerbal portrait, so we're just going to throttle down as we get up to orbital speed, so there we go, we can detach that, and we're going to press the action group 1, which deactivates the vector engines permanently, we can't reactivate them now unless we manually do it, and it also disables their gimbal as well, and then we can press action group 3 to to toggle the orbital engines on. Now this isn't a completely accurate a replica to the American Space Shuttle because the American Space Shuttle, uh, the orbital maneuver engines were fueled by monopropellant and this is obviously using liquid fuel and oxidizer. Just because the monopropellant engines in this game don't have very good thrust and I wanted this to be able to get to places reasonably quickly. I mean, yeah, you could just strap more and more monopropellant engines on to get sufficient power, but I, think it, I thought it just looked a lot cleaner to have these um, you know, the Terrier engines instead, the LV909s, and just the way the fuel tanks can be made, built, like the liquid fuel and oxidizer fuel tanks can be made to look a little bit nicer than the sh just the cylindrical monopellant tanks. Um, yeah, so here we are just getting our maneuver node. The purpose of this mission was really just to showcase the uh, the shuttle's ability to carry a 36 ton payload. I think I've just seemed to see that the orange tank, there we go, the orange tank tends to be the standard measure of an SSTO or Space Shuttle's capability in terms of carrying cargo to LKO because like the big science lab and things fall well below the 36 ton threshold limit so if you can carry a, a, an orange tank to orbit no problem then you've got, a pretty, you've got yourself a pretty diverse orbiter there. So we're just tweaking our encounter so we can use the main engine to get close enough and then we can use the RCS thrusters using H&N to do very fine maneuvers forwards and backwards to get our encounter as close as possible. I accidentally did physical time warp there actually which um, can screw up your encounter so in the end I was the separation was about 1.6 kilometers at this point but if you look at the top right just no, just to the right of the altitude gauge you can see we've got the total delta V which is currently at 237 meters per second. Now, that's definitely enough to rendezvous with the space station, and that's not even forgetting that once we've uh, deployed the orange tank and we've lost all that weight, our delta V will significantly increase when it comes to uh, required needing to de ourselves. But even if worse comes to worse, we do have RCS thrusters so we could de ourselves using those anyway. Now, the more eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that my ratio of liquid fuel to oxidizer is a little bit off compared to what it would normally be for liquid fuel and oxidizer based uh, vehicles. Uh, the ratio of liquid fuel to oxidizer in normal Kerbal Space Program rockets is every 9 units of liquid fuel, there are 11 units of oxidizer. 
On this craft, the ratio is a little bit closer. Uh, we've got a 19 to 17 ratio of oxidizer to liquid fuel. The reason is I've got a little bit of extra liquid fuel is because, if you can see on the back there, nestled between the vector engines is a very small jet engine, just to help those of you get, um, get to the runway uh, when you're getting this thing back to the Kerbal Space Center. It makes it a little bit easier just to have a little bit of extra pushing power in case you undershoot or overshoot and need to steer yourself back. And there's a lovely shot of the crew just there. For the purposes of this mission, I wanted to prove that you don't actually need the jet engine to perform a landing. So for the duration of this video, I won't be using that jet engine. But for those of you that want to use it, oh, this is obviously going, it goes without saying that the craft file is in the description. But for those of you that are struggling or just want it, just can't really be bothered to, you know, put in the time to get this thing to glide to the Kerbal Space Center, which, you know, we're all busy people, I understand that, then it's there for you. I will, however, be using the jet engine to perform braking, though. Um, pressing action group 4 will toggle reverse thrust on that engine, because this thing doesn't have parachutes. Uh, I quite like the sort of cleaner approach of just using reversing jet engines to slow this thing down to a stop. Anyway, here we are at the space station. So this is already a refueling depot, so I thought, why not extend the refueling capabilities of this thing? So we're going to open up the front docking port of the space shuttle. I know the real one didn't have a docking port there, but... Mine does, so, you know, go away. And we can open up the cargo bay. Now, that's actually two cargo bays. It's the longest cargo bay and the shortest cargo bay combined to make a slightly longer than the longest kind of cargo bay, if that makes sense. So it's got a very big capacity, this thing. Obviously, the orange tank is about the upper limit of what it can carry to orbit. Obviously, we've got those other bits of instrumentation back there. So, I mean, if you stripped all those out, you could probably squeeze a little bit more capacity into this thing. But, you know, for practicality's sake, we'll say the orange tank is the limit. And here we are deploying the tug. So we're going to try and guide the orange tank to the location we need it. So we're going to deploy the small RCS tug. So we're going to dock to it there. And then we're just going to detach the orange tank and swing it up, we're going to be putting it on the other end of the existing orange tank. Now, this isn't the first video this station's appeared in, and every single time it appears I have to mention its origins, because I really like the origins of this space station. It w it's called the NS Station, which stands for Non-Stop Station, because it was built in one mission using one SSTO. So the SSTO um, was started at the runway, that's why the modules have got wheels on them by the way. So the SSTO was empty on the runway, all the modules were preloaded into the little car park area outside the space plane hangar. One was wheeled onto the space plane. The little tug drove away, left the module inside. SSTO closed up, launched itself, got into orbit, left the module there, deorbited itself, landed back at the runway. Then a small truck, so without reverting or recovering or doing anything like this, uh, we, we sent out a refueling truck to go and refill the tanks manually before adding the next module manually again and then sending the SSTO off to orbit once again to add to the space station again. So, uh, for those who want to watch that, there is going to be a link at the end of this video, in the last 20 seconds that will take you to that. And other than that, so we only have 2.02 .02 units of model propellant left in this thing, so I was being very conservative with my manoeuvres here. Um, I guess we could have pumped a little bit of fuel into it from the space station itself, because it does have a model propellant tank, but, you know, we're here to expand the refueling reserves, not consume them, so... We're not going to do that. And there we are. It's all done. There's a little just an evidence that the fuel tanks are full. And we can just uh, get ready to depart, I suppose. So we can do a qu few quick cinematic shots at a completely nauseating speed and camera angle. Uh, and then we can just right click to undock the shuttle from the space station. Get nice and clear to make sure we don't break those solar panels before closing the thing. It kind of looked like I nudged it for a second there. I don't remember, I don't think I actually nudged it though. I think it just, I think that's just the perspective of that particular shot made it look like I hit it. And then we can point ourselves a retrograde relative to our orbit and we can open up the map view as well in order to get ourselves, make sure that we're on a trajectory that puts us at the runway. Now I did this first time, but I have done this as my back catalogue of videos will hopefully show. I've done this so many times that it's not that difficult for me to do it anymore. If this is your first time or you've not got that much practice landing at the runway, it'll probably take a few attempts, so quick save and quick load are your friends. I would recommend Alt F5 or Alt F9 so you can have multiple quick saves just to make the whole thing a little bit easier. I tend to put my periapsis nice and low just above that peninsula uh, to the right or to the east of the Kerbal Space Centre. That just tends to be the best way of doing it, but it really depends on the craft. 
um, my orbital speed, everything like that. There are a few variables. Now, the big complaint a lot of people had with the Brutus was that it was very, very unstable. A lot of people having had trouble um, getting it to re-enter and fly uh, stably without entering a stall. It would very, very easily break into a flat spin. And unfortunately, that is just typical of Kerbal Space Program space shuttles, unfortunately. They're just not very aerodynamic. But, you know, so is the real space shuttle. That was a very, very, very unstable in flight. So, you know, just you got to get good, mate. Just watch, watch this video and learn from what I'm doing. I mean, the Brutus video was very abridged. It didn't show an uncut flight. It didn't show me the whole thing. So here you go. Here is an uncut flight, uh, which we're going to glide it back to the runway without using any engine power at all. Um, like I, did I mention earlier that I did use the jet engine just to brake when I was actually touched down on the runway, but I mean if I didn't activate the engine, well I would have still rolled to a stop eventually using the brakes, but I thought, ah, I, I feel like I, I've put it on now, I want to use it. <laughs> so there we go, so what I'm doing here is just very, holding it still, you don't want to do too many violent manoeuvres, you can see actually if you look to the bottom left, the pitch, roll and yaw controls actually have light blue arrows as opposed to the standard orange ones. You do this by pressing caps lock and it just, it's just fine, it's fine controls. So, uh, the controls are a lot less twitchy and it's far more well suited to flying aircraft and things. I don't tend to like using them for flying SSTOs and things and even when we launched this space shuttle, um, I didn't use them. But for re-entry, when we really don't want to be doing too many violent inputs, they're very good. So there we go, Those buffed, that buffed heat tolerance is really coming into its own here as we blast through the atmosphere at 1500 meters per second, well, we were, and not even getting a single temperature gauge show up. Um, again, like all my videos, this is played at 100% uh, re-entry heating, normal settings, there's no weird things going on here. And as you can see, we started to dip down a little bit, so we just pitched up to gain a bit more range, and there's this runway below us, we can just start to twist ourselves, and I actually lost it here. I was so busy trying to get myself on the right trajectory here because we are going, well, the space shuttle is uh, south of the runway, so I tried to steer myself. But if you look at my surface speed, it is very rapidly dropping to stall levels just because when we tilt, tilt the space shuttle at that kind of extreme angle, it essentially acts like one giant air brake and you'll just drop off speed like a stone. And now we are dropping like a stone, if that's if stones tumble like that. So the way you get out of a stall is I just deactivated SAS and just let it fall, just let it nosedive for a bit, picked up lots of speed, and with speed comes stability. So once we hit to see this, because we've been very conservative in how we pitch this thing up, but we've got, we're still very high up, so we have loads of room to make adjustments, but now we're getting nice and close to the runway. We can deploy the landing gear and get ourselves on a homeward trajectory. So. That was kind of my tips for getting this thing back to the Kerbal Space Center. Only tips for flying, really. It will take a few attempts. It, this was my first attempt at getting this thing back to the Kerbal Space Center, but it took me a lot of attempts to get it into orbit. They're just very, very unstable to fly by their design. Um, the one thing I'd recommend, while, before the SRBs detach, I would avoid using any of the WASD controls. I would instead just use Shift and Control to change the thrust of the vector engines, because the less thrust from the vectors... Oh yeah, I accidentally t activated all engines there for a second there, but... There's the reverse thrust of the jet engine there, and there we are, landed! Like I say, just using Shift and Control, by changing the thrust of the vectors, you'll for cause the shuttle to tip over more to the east because of the um, unbalance with the SRBs. Anyway, that's the end of this week's video, so I hope you enjoyed it. And on screen now, top left is the construction of that space station you just saw, top right is my other space shuttle video, and bottom right is a video specially selected for you by YouTube's algorithm. Other than that, uh, Twitter, Patreon, Discord, all in the description, and thank you for watching.